University. I'd like to ask everyone, if you haven't already, to mute your microphones. That uh, cuts down on background noise. And um, <clears throat> as we're uh, proceeding through, um, you may have uh, uh, questions that arise. Uh, our presentation will go about 40 minutes from the time we start it. And uh, once we've concluded presenting, then we'll uh, open it up for any questions that anybody has. Uh, let me just say that, you know, I'll stay as late as I need to. If, if you have a question and, and you wanna talk about it, um, I'll be here. Jared and Sarah will be here, you know, until their uh, social lives take over. But uh, I don't have that problem. Also, you can put questions into the chat if it's uh, the case that you need to leave and uh, you, you do have a question, put your question in the chat, include an email, I will get back to you. The other thing I would say is that there will be a, a bibliography at the end of the presentation. If it is the case that you want to have the bibliography, uh, again, just put your, just say that in the chat, put your email, and I'll see to it that you are uh, able to, uh, to uh, get the bibliography. Um, so let's see if there's any other preliminaries that uh, I need to say here. Oh, yes. Um, finally, I would say that as we proceed, there, are, there is a number of visuals here. Uh, some of them are, uh, I'd have to say, quite distressing. So uh, I want to uh, raise that to your attention now. Uh, honestly, if you have uh, small children around, I, I wouldn't, um, I, I would be cautious about that. Um, all right, so <clears throat> tonight as part of the Harry Knights exhibit at Seton Hill University, we are discussing the historical background to uh, Harry Knights photos. And in particular, we are going to be talking about the uh, episode at the end of the war known as the Death Marches and about the, uh, in particular, the massacre at Gardeligan. If you've had a chance to go to the exhibit, you know that there are a number of photos from the, the Gardeligan massacre and um, we're, we're not going to show all of those photos, but um, I, urge you to take some time with the uh, with the exhibit it's it's quite a uh, it, it's quite a, a, a striking exhibit of, of photography um, so um, and as we get into this let me just say that there are four students who worked on this um, you met two of them last week Phoebe Waltzak Anna Vincent um, all of the students at Seton Hill uh, you know, this is 31 years for me. Uh, I consider working with these students a real privilege. The four students who I've worked with on this exhibit, I would say that is even more the case. These are uh, outstanding students and um, they have, uh, they've shown some uh, real resilience and um, they've shown some real character in, in bringing this together. And um, I'm very pleased to uh, be able to, to be here tonight for them to talk about their work. Um, let me go to the screen share for everyone and we will get into, um, there we go, got to sign in again. Um, all right. And I hope we're going to be back in the Seton Hill environment here momentarily. Yes, okay. So. The um, two students that Uh, we'll be presenting tonight Sarah Louise Johnson, a Seton, Seton Hill graduate in history and political science, and 
She is now completing her master's degree in innovative education at Seton Hill University. And Jared Kroll, who is a junior uh, history major at Seton Hill. So let's, uh, let's move on, on into this. Sarah, let's begin with you. In order to have a chance to understand what is going on in this event that is highlighted here, we need to have a clear understanding of the situation in Germany as um, 1944 concludes, 1945 begins. Uh, the defeat of Germany is imminent. It is being invaded by the allies from east and west. Um, there is no possibility of some kind of, you know, bolt from the blue. So Jared, uh, Sarah, let's, let's begin with you talking about um, what's, uh, what's happening in, the uh, network of concentration camps in Germany and the uh, uh, other areas under German control at this time. Yeah, so as you said, towards the end of the war, it was becoming uh, more and more obvious that Germany was headed for defeat as uh, the Soviets closed in on them from the east. And then the French and British and Americans were closing in on them from the west. So. As the Allied powers invaded, they would liberate concentration camps as they passed them on their way to the heartland of Germany. Uh, so as a result, it became one of Germany's concerns beginning in the winter of 1944 to 1945 to evacuate prisoners from concentration camps on the front and then transport them to other camps that were deeper into the center of Germany. Uh, so these forced evacuations, which eventually became known by this term death marches, prevented prisoners from being liberated by the Allied powers and being able to testify or give any evidence of the, amass of the mass atrocities that Germany had committed in the concentration camps. And in order to carry out these evacuations, the uh, camp prisoners would be forced to either walk or ride in train cars for long distances in the bitter cold and they didn't have, they lacked clothing, much food or water. And uh, as a result of that is uh, best estimates put it at 250,000 prisoners having uh, died in only a matter of months. Yeah. And what, what, how did the role of concentration camps change over the course of the war? Uh, so one important concept that we had been finding during our research is that the time period of the death marches is considered to be uh, like a unique phase of genocide that departs from the Holocaust and the final solution, which is what usually comes to mind when we talk about genocide as it occurred in World War II. So the shift in the role and purpose for, for concentration camps reflects this. Uh, before the end of 1943, concentration camps were made to incarcerate people who the Nazi regime viewed as uh, like a security threat. So people were held in concentration camps because they were Jews or communists or handicapped or homosexual or among other identities that so-called disqualified them from the perfect Aryan race. Um, and just as well, these, con uh, these concentration camps were centers for labor that would go towards the German war effort. But towards the end of 1944 and beyond, this role of concentration camps uh, started to shift. So as prisoners were evacuated from one camp to another, the main purpose of the camp became to prevent the capture of prisoners by the Allied powers so they couldn't uh, basically give evidence of the mass atrocities that were committed. So the so-called Jewish question was no longer really the overarching goal and the identity of the prisoners were no longer even really of much importance. They were just viewed as prisoners. And so this carried along the stigma that they were murderers and thieves and people just like, generally unfit for German society. Whereas during the Holocaust period, prisoners would have been killed based on their nationality or ethnicity, ethnicity or ideology. Um, but now their fate was made based on their physical condition and simply 
the cost to keep them alive. Um, and just as well with all of these camps being overcrowded to the brink of failure, any meaningful production towards the war effort was nearly impossible. And so the role of concentration camps was really just to hold prisoners hostage and prevent their capture by the Allies. So what is it that prompted this, this movement that became known as the death marches? Where did the, the orders come from and, and what did the Nazi leadership seek to accomplish? Uh, the order that is usually cited as the generator or the starter of the death marches came from Heinrich Himmler, who was Hitler's second in command. And this came on June 17th, 1944. And in the order, he instructed to never let any living prisoner fall into enemy hands. Um, and even though the order didn't mention mass killing as a strategy for achieving this goal outright, uh, the order was so vague that it kind of allowed for various interpretations. Uh, so with these orders, the Allied powers were heading closer and closer to uh, the various concentration camps all around Germany, and prisoners were being evacuated from them and taken on these death marches in order to fulfill Himmler's orders that they weren't captured by the Allies. Um, but because of the chaos surrounding these decisions and just the terrible physical conditions of the prisoners, moving them along was uh, really slow, and it often became clear that outrunning the Allied troops would not be possible. So at this point, without any real clear specific orders from above from the administration, the result was a decentralized infrastructure of decision making. So now whoever was with the prisoners at the time, whether they be SS guards, Hitler youth members, or any other civilians who were concerned about their town safety, as the prisoners passed through them, uh, they were the ones deciding whether prisoners would live or die. So in many instances, including in Gardelegen, this decentralized structure combined with fear of being outrun by the allies resulted in mass killings of the prisoners uh, so that they would not fall into enemy hands alive. Yeah, that's, that's um, it, it's really important to understand that this was a, a real, period of chaos. And uh, just to underline that um, this went on at a, at a time when it was clear that Germany would be defeated and there, there was no possible military advantage to be gained from this, this mass movement of prisoners. Jared, what was the military situation in the, uh, in the Western Front by the winter of 1944? into the spring of 1945? Well, by the winter of 1944, the Allies had liberated most of France and were preparing to begin their push into Germany proper. However, in December 1944, the Germans' last ditch counter assault through the Ardennes, the Battle of the Bulge, would prove to be a significant setback for the Allies' objectives, but also a significant drain on Wehrmacht men and resources from which they could not recover. By January 1945, the German assault had been repulsed, with none of their strategic objectives achieved, setting the stage for an Allied thrust through the Siegfried Line and into Germany. At this point, even, the, even though the Germans still put up a stiff defense, it became increasingly apparent the Allies had the initiative and advantage overall. In late February, the Allies crossed the Ruhr, and in March, they crossed the Rhine, removing the last significant barriers to a large-scale breakout into Germany proper. Allied forces swiftly advanced through Germany during April, meeting significantly less organized resistance. The first al Allied troops reached the Elbe, west of Berlin, by the end of April, and the war in Europe came to an end in early May. Good. Um, and what about, in particular, the 102nd Infantry Division? Well, the 102nd was assigned to the northern part of the front, on, on near the German-Dutch border, reaching the front in November 1944. They began their wartime action that same month in an advance to the Ruhr River, taking their primary goal of Linich in the first few days of December. With the Ger German counteroffensive to the south in the Ardennes during December, the divisions accompanying the 102nd were redeployed to help stem the tide, stem the tide leaving them as the only division to defending a stretch of the front almost eight miles. 
The 102nd spent January 1945 mopping up remaining German defenders on their side of the Ruhr, with the last major German stronghold, Brachelen, falling on the 26th. By the start of February, the Allied advance across the Ruhr was ready, with the 102nd being chosen to lead the assault. However, heavy flooding delayed the advance until late February. The crossing finally commenced on the 23rd, with the 102nd being the first division to completely cross the Ruhr. Leading the push towards the Rhine, in early March, the 102nd captured the key city of Prefeld, home to 170,000 and a key railroad hub, communication center, and rocket production facility. The 102nd crossed the Rhine in the first few days of April, and on the 9th of that month, month they faced stiff resistance in the Vesa Uplands area. Three days of bloody fighting ended with the 102nd victorious. Following, following this major engagement, the 102nd pushed swiftly towards Elba, reaching its banks by the 21st. And when did the division, uh, here on the map, you can see we've marked Gardelagen with the, uh, the, the red arrow. Uh, when, did the Gar when did the 102nd uh, arrive in Gardelagen? And what were the circumstances that uh, uh, took place with the surrender there? Well, the circumstances were frankly a little unusual. The 102nd reached uh, Gardelagen on April 14th and captured the city without any fighting. Lieutenant Hunt, a liaison officer between headquarters and his tank battalion, was captured by the Germans. During his questioning, he was able to convince the commander in charge that a large number of American tanks were ready to launch an assault on the town, and that it was then in their best interest to surrender. The German commander promptly surrendered to the nearest American unit and led the 102nd into the town without any resistance. So this uh, footage was uh, from a cameraman that uh, accompanied the 102nd and uh, this, these are um, actual uh, uh, instances of, of the fighting that took place. So Jared, when did the division arrive at Gardelag and um, what, what did the 102nd find when they arrived in Gardelag and after they captured the town? Well, um, after capturing the town just outside of it, they discovered the smoldering remains of the barn which proved to be the site of the Gardelag and massacre where 1,016 prisoners of war and political prisoners were murdered. The commander of the 102nd, General Keating, ordered 300 men from Gardelagen to exist in, assist in exhuming in the burial of 586 bodies taken from, taken from the hasty mass graves and 430 bodies from the scorched barn. Let's move on. Um, we'll come back to this uh, uh, this very uh, uh, striking incident. Uh, but Sarah, how did how did Gardelagen become a collection point for concentration camp prisoners? Uh, where were they brought from? So Gardelagen is a city in northern Germany, um, and it became a stopping point for prisoners in April of 1945 as they were being marched to concentration concentration camps further south, including the Bergen-Belsen, the Sachsenhausen, and the 
uh, Noingama camps, and they were originally being brought from Dora Middlebow and a few of its subcamps. And the plan was to transport the prisoners by train um, because of their poor physical conditions. Uh, but in a village called Mista, right outside of Garlegen, an American air raid damaged the rails, and thus the prisoners were unable to travel any further by train. And so by this point, many of the uh, SS guards who had but been put in charge of transporting the prisoners fled from the scene uh, because they were nervous that the Allied troops would catch up to the group and, and take them prisoner. Um, so instead, there were local Volkssturm and Hitler youth um, who began to assume control of the situation. Um, and as many, of, as many of the prisoners were in just this terrible physical condition and not able to walk the distance it would take to get to their original intended destination, uh, the decision was made to bring them to a cavalry school, which was uh, basically a big building in downtown Garlegen. And what was the decision-making decision process um, regarding the prisoners? Uh, who are the key decision makers here? Uh, once the prisoners were, were brought to the cavalry school, many German citizens within the town of Garlegen were anxious about having the prisoners in their town because of the stigma that, that comes with being a prisoner. And they believed that the prisoners would make an attempt to escape and basically just uh, run rampant through their town. And uh, there were rumors that they were killing and, and raping its citizens. Uh, uh, and uh, just as well, the SS guards having abandoned the prisoners at Mista, um, now the locals within the community took it upon themselves to make decisions regarding the prisoners. Um, and the person who, who made the call on where the prisoners would be kept and what would be done with them, you know, the, the final decision to, to actually uh, take part in this mass killing was the Christleiter, which is uh, the county leader. And his name was Gerhard Tila, um, who, by the way, was never punished for his crimes. And he, li he lived to a very old age until 1944. Um, so others within the community helped hunt down um, escaped prisoners in the town um, who, who were able to escape whenever the air raid happened. And they transported them uh, from one place to another um, to help exterminate the prisoners. And even after, after they took part in the crime, um, they helped to cover it up and to bury all of the bodies. So these community mem members range from Volkssturm, uh, Hitler Youth members, a few remaining SS guards, and Wehrmacht and Luftwaffe soldiers. Yeah. Um, we'll just pause over this um, quote from uh, one of the scholars of, of this uh, incident. Let me ask both of you to contribute here. What, how did this, um, how did the actual um, work of the massacre take place? Oh, I'll, I'll uh, go first. So once these uh, prisoners were moved to this barn, the Ishniba Ish um, barn outside of town, uh, they were put into the barn and soldiers or the ragtag group of uh, whoever, like Luftwaffe, Volkssturm, you know, Hitler Youth, as you said, they surrounded the barn and uh, they set the straw from the barn on fire. And the, the prisoners, prisoners uh, made attempts to put it out. Um, I think a few were like, they put it out and then they had to start it again and they put it out. Um, but then they, for once the barn got caught on fire, it was on fire um, and it was burning and any, uh, Prisoners who ran out of the barn, they were shot, uh, shot with rifles, machine guns, hand grenades, just uh, even anti-tank weapons. They just, it was brutal, just horrible. So, um, the, it, miraculously, a, a few did escape. I think something like 25 escaped um, the, uh, the slaughter. 
and their their stories were were later um, gathered, and that, that's how we know much of what took place among the prisoners. Um, once the the slaughter had had taken place, what 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 were efforts were made um, by Tila and uh, by the town to um, cover the, cover up what had uh, happened there? So uh, basically. Um the citizens in the town had already started, as Jared, I think, mentioned earlier, to uh, basically start digging these mass graves um, alongside, you know, like the right outside of the barn. And um, I think we also saw it a little bit in the videos of uh, basically just uh, attempting to bury the prisoners in the mass graves and it was it was something a little like I think a little bit over half of them they had already been able to uh, bury in these graves um, and um, they they were unable to finish the job before uh, the US troops had come upon them and, and found what was happening right and we saw the uh part of the letter from, from Father uh, Glenn, who said that the, the bodies, when, when the Americans arrived, the bodies were still smoldering. Yeah. So um, let's just uh, briefly uh, turn to the, uh, the issue of uh, war crimes justice. And um, Sarah, you looked into this a little bit. Uh, what, what were the, uh, what were the results of the prosecutions that took place? Yeah, so um, immediately after um, it was discovered that this had happened in Garlegan, um, there was an interrogation of, of some of the surviving prisoners, as well as some of the citizens who had witnessed it. Um, and so some, some survivors were even asked to remain at the barn to assist in pointing out um, the citizens who had been involved in the crime. And uh, the Americans also interrogated some of the Volkstern men who had been involved. And by the end, uh, we had found that they had collected 99 testimonies and, ar and arrested 26 people who had been charged with involvement in the massacre. Um, and these people were held in a, de in a detention camp uh, where quite a few of them actually ended up committing suicide. Um, and then the only other person who was arrested for this crime, like a, a higher up in the administration, was er Erhard Brawny, who was the transport leader for the prisoners as they were being evacuated from uh, Dora Middlebow, and he was sentenced to life in prison um, in 1947, but then he, he died uh, just three years later of leukemia. And then there was uh, Gerhard Tila, who I mentioned earlier, who had given the go-ahead for the, the actual liquidation, um, but he escaped and he lived free until he died uh, in 1994 at the age of 85. Okay, thank you uh, both. Um, and we have thank yous to others who have been involved in this, uh, in this exhibit. Um, and I'm going to uh, pause here and uh, open it up for any questions. As I said, if you're interested in having the um, <clears throat> bibliography, uh, just leave your email in the uh, chat and uh, I'll make sure that uh, it gets to you. Hi, um, that was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much um, for sharing everything. I apologize, I came in a little bit late, so I'm sorry if you've already answered this. Okay, um, you missed the best stuff, Phoebe. I know, I, I feel so horrible, I got caught in traffic. Um, however, I, I wanted to ask, what was the experience like for you guys as you were kind of doing this research? Because I know 
for me personally, going through just viewing the images, um, as well as reading your white papers, um, it was all, you know, it's, it's heavy, difficult information. So did you kind of struggle at times to, to work your way through it since you went so much more in depth even um, than, you know, Hannah and myself as the co-curators? I can, I can go if you'd like, Jared. Um, I, my first reaction to it was I was just so surprised that I had never heard about it before um, because like something this huge you you would have think like thought that uh, we would have learned about it in like our history classes or anything like that um, so I guess like my my main like looking back I I just remember being so surprised by it I would also say that it was kind of this uh, contradiction between just like wanting to learn everything about it um, and just wanting to like dig deeper and deeper into it, but also having that feeling of like, I need to step away for a while and actually like digest what I've been reading. Um, so yeah, that, I, that was my main reaction to researching it, especially at first. I, um, I, when we saw the pictures, when we were looking through the archive, just some of them are just so atrocious just I like they're very hard to look at some of the pictures just reading like the research um didn't like I realized the gravity of it but it didn't like affect me as much but seeing the images like seeing just like these horrible images of this atrocity really did um really did impact me a lot yeah. um Jared in some way you anticipated my question um and it's to both of you as historians, how, you know, you read journals, you read text, um, how is that confronting these primary documents that are um, visual, visceral? Um, how did that work for and with each of you? If you could expand, thank you. I, um, I think reading the documents, like reading the documents where it's just like an account um, or like not an account, but like where it just says like this happened here, um, that doesn't have as much of an impact as when you read like the letters, like um, Knight's letters and um, Father Glenn's letters. Like it's just like when they see like firsthand the thing, it really you can actually like put yourself into their shoes and see like oh my gosh, like this this really adds a whole new dimension to it. Where um, that when you look at the pictures that um adds like a similar feeling but it's some ways it's more like visceral because it's like it adds a whole new dimension to it when you read someone else's writing it's just it's something else yeah i would also say that it was interesting especially reading like um secondary sources um trying to uh, dissect these different uh, photos and um, testimonies and things like that. It wasn't just a, oh my gosh, look at how how terrible these pictures are. Can you imagine that something like this happened? There was always some sort of like, a kind of like putting a narrative to the story and trying to understand um, like how something like this was allowed to happen, like how it was able to happen, um, and what people's like intentions or motivations were behind it. Even though like it's it's nearly impossible for us to fathom um, like how somebody can uh, con like convince themselves or other people that like that uh, this it is okay to like reach the end goal um i think it it helps to like try to put things into perspective rather than than just trying to just, like putting those photos out there just to like look at them i guess yeah i think um one of the great challenges when uh, we study genocide like in more generally not only like garda or the holocaust is to 
make sure we're not too far detached from it because these instances like these war crimes they're they're awful they're terrible and so like it's important for me at least um to keep myself like thinking like just how terrible this would be and not like into like okay this happened then kind of thing just keeping that in mind is important to me yeah, this is jim i uh first of all sarah and jared you did a great job on this and i i appreciate it uh Rather honoring my father's work. And it's interesting listening to your perspectives on looking at these photographs because I grew up with them. I can remember going through my father's albums and seeing these things from a, my earliest, earliest memories uh, almost. And when I was a teenager, younger than you two, I uh, got into photography and I uh, practiced printing his, his negatives from the uh, massacre. So uh, to me, this brings it all back full circle and really... Um, creates a lot of closure, I think, on this whole incident for me. Um, so I appreciate everything that the, uh, the Holocaust Center has done. And I think, uh, I'm looking at the, at the chat, uh, Dave Kavner is on. It looks like he may have more photographs, John. I would, I would um, love to have access to them, Mr. Kavner, if, if that's possible. <laughs> One of the things that Jim Knights has said in, in other of these uh, presentations is that, uh, Jim, you jump in if I'm misrepresenting you, but your, your father said relatively little about his experience in the war. Um, that's, that's my experience again and again, having talked to many veterans over the years that, um, and not just of World War II. Um, but, <clears throat> You look at these photos, you see that footage that we saw there, it's, it's, it's uh, shocking. If, if, if someone was there in real life, I mean, wh what would you bring back to, to say about that? Um, it, you know, the, the, the words that Father Glenn wrote, um, the, the still smoldering bodies, um, it just, it's just astonishing to me that, um, you know, people, were able to, to, to see these things and, and to, to say anything about it. But I'll tell you, uh, John, he, uh, my dad, um, he went through this, took the photographs, apparently visited uh, Buchenwald and Dachau as well, had a friend like Father Glenn that I'm named after. Um, but I'll tell you, you think this would have made somebody really very tolerant? It, it didn't. He was very intolerant, you know, my whole life. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. But I, when I got older, I looked, I thought back and I said, I, 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 what was going through his mind? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what did he not learn anything from this? <laughs> so. John and everybody, we have uh, some interesting comments in the chat. Uh, we mentioned Dave Kavner who might want to jump in. And also there's a Jim, is it Fury? Who said that uh, you also have been researching the 102nd and are yeah, Jim Fury. a documentary of it. Yes. Yeah, can you tell uh, My father, just like you're saying, uh, until about four years ago, he's now 96, still alive. He didn't want to talk about it. I never knew about it. Even when I was studying uh, World War II during high school, he was my he was the high school principal. He never ever mentioned. My sister and I came across some pictures once, and uh, he didn't want to. Then he just uh, said, "You shouldn't be looking at those," and uh, he just didn't want to talk about it. But he finally came around about four years ago because he's getting up in age, and he said he didn't want the world to forget. And so uh, through a friend, we found a, a Hollywood, uh, he's actually in Atlanta, which is Hollywood East uh, director who g got interested in it and uh, started working on the documentary about four years ago. It's a fill-in project for him. He actually took a film crew to Germany and found uh, three eyewitnesses to the tragedy, saw the barn burning, and uh, they were willing to speak about it. Now, of course, they're up in age, but they were kids at the time. And that'll be part of the documentary, including interviews with my father, with uh, Dave Kavner's on the call here, with uh, some folks that he knew. 
uh, his father, as you, I think Dave commented here, was an eyewitness to it, but he, he's not around to be interviewed anymore. But um, it's actually a very sobering documentary. It's hard to watch as, you know, your footage was excellent. So you, you know what we're talking about. But it's a very uh, sad but interesting story. Uh, Jim, we're, we'll uh, follow up with you about that. Um, uh, I'm excited to uh, to know that there's a documentary in process, so we'll we'll keep in touch about it. We we have your email information, and yes. I will uh, I will follow up with you. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, I think you saw Dave uh, ask about the footage, and I, I don't know what the legalities are, and I don't want to do anything that you would be uncomfortable with, but some of that footage, uh, we're not done yet. Uh, it's it's nearly complete. It just has to be finished up, you know, the final touches by the director and producer. But uh, some of that footage I think would be excellent, but again, um, I don't want to, I don't know what the legalities are. Well, Jim, the, the 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 footage that we showed, we took off of YouTube, so it's um, oh, okay. It, it's been published in that form, and in fact, if you put your email into the chat, Jared will send you the the link to that. Okay. The, there what was, you saw was was actually edited by Jared. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a much longer it's a lo much longer newsreel uh, piece. Okay, I'll do that. There was uh, a. Or, um, of the actual massacre. I just, um, I edited it up so it was um, some of the uh, soldiers like moving around with the tanks and then some of the um, the soldier or the uh, civilians digging up the graves. Um, it was on YouTube, it's uh, called uh, World War II Gardeleg and Massacre Murder Inc. Um, so. Okay, and our, our director, I know he pulled a lot of pictures and video off the internet uh, when he was putting, he's working on the final touches. Uh, so he may have some of that video, though. Uh, I hadn't seen it in the footage that we had. We have a lot of still pictures, uh, you know, and so the, what you showed all looked familiar, but the video with the shoveling the, the ground, I don't think we had pictures, but I don't think we had that video. But maybe we do now, because I haven't seen what our directors put together for like six months. He works on major projects, you know, those production films like for Netflix. And then when between projects, he works on this. Um, let me respond to something that Maureen asked um, in terms of what, what the things in the, um, in this research had had the most impact. Certainly seeing these pictures is um, unfortunately unforgettable. But for me, it was actually one of the things that was a real um, uh, moment I, I was taken aback was was reading the um, that uh, article by Deanna Green, uh, where you know she talks about the the guards set to watch the prisoners and who who participated in the mass uh, in the massacre. SS, you expect that. Regular military. But Volkssturm, these Volkssturm were, you know, these you know, like middle-aged guys with, with little training and lousy weapons and um, Hitler Jungen, uh, labor service personnel, police, firefighters, civilians, and even prisoners. Um, you know, when I, when I read it, I, I, had to, I had to step back from it. I, I thought I had, I thought, you know, I had mistranslated it in, in, in my head in German. It, it, it just seemed so, um, so against, uh, you know, the idea that uh, these, these massacres are, are carried out by uniformed professionals. And, and here we have one where the uniformed professionals are actually recruiting anybody that they can, they can get their hands on, including yes. prisoners, including prisoners. So, um, you know, just, just generally, this, this raises a lot of issues about the, uh, the, the issue of who, who, who's a perpetrator, who are the perpetrators, yes. um, you know, who's able to be a perpetrator. Um, 
So it's, it's no wonder that, that Daniel Blattman, who's, who's done the major study on the death marches, calls this one uh, a, uh, you know, a symbol of, of the, um, uh, the central dramatic incident to a large degree representative of the entire death march phenomenon. Are you all aware of the Treaty of Gorda Lagan? The uh, memorial? No, it's called the Treaty of Gorda Lagan. Uh, and the reason uh, I'm aware of that is because four years ago, when my father started speaking up, he kept talking about the Treaty of Gorda Lagan. And uh, I, I really, it wasn't registering with me. I, I didn't know what he was talking about, so I didn't really give it fair credit. And then he gave me some documents and at the time, whenever uh, the U.S. Army came in, the 102nd, uh, they ultimately, and, I, and Dave probably knows, Dave Kavner probably knows the name of the individuals, but they made a treaty with the city of Garda Lagan that is still true to this day that from that point forward, you know, they, they had to excavate, there was a mass grave, as you know, and they had to excavate and do proper burials of all of the prisoners. And you know, you, you could, we literally have pictures of that because we were in Germany with the crew. And you know, it's, it's very organized, but they perpetually have to maintain that cemetery um, and, and, and they do. But that right. was part of the treaty of the, the army with that city. It's called the Treaty of Garda Lagan. Yeah. And they, right. they went into the town and they marched all the townspeople out. They had to all go by the barn and see what they did and then the males the uh, adult males had to dig out all the bodies and properly bury every single one right yeah even so the town wanted to put it behind them and uh in, yeah. in the decades after the war that yeah. um the the memorial was allowed to uh decline um, people were discouraged from going there. Now yeah. in the 90s, things took a different turn in Germany and uh, the recognition of the, of the crimes of the Holocaust and of the death marches, not, not really part of the Holocaust, all of these became much more clearly seen as, a, as an essential project for uh, German people. Yeah, I didn't know that. I didn't know that it had deteriorated. Uh, it looked very good uh, in 2016 yeah, when they were yeah, there. Yeah, because yeah, it had it went in and was completely rehabilitated since yeah. the 90s. Well, you yeah. know, John, that that gets to the issue of how do we confront the unpleasant truths of our history? You know, here in the United States, there are also those who don't want to hear much about our slave past. Um, uh, you know, there have been pushbacks at some of the, um, some of the plantations in the South when the tours focus, some people think too much on the plight of the slaves and the way they were treated. So there's this desire to sometimes forget these atrocities and as you say, move on uh, to, uh, uh, to to a new place, but I think it's a it's a sign of health for a society to be honest and to confront the truth in in gotcha. a factual way. And so that seems to be what's happening here for the time being, anyway. But there are other places, like in Poland, for example, where there's been an attempt to deny um, you know some of the atrocities that were committed there. So it's. It's something that every nation uh, has to uh, to struggle with. Interesting, whenever the uh, German eyewitnesses who are up in age now were interviewed, but they're, you know, they're very, their minds are very good. Uh, they, one of them in particular got very emotional. I mean, Lily could hardly talk about it. Uh, but they, they also shared that there were those who, uh, uh, wanted to, you know, wanted to put it aside and even deny mm -hmm. and, 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 and not take responsibility for doing it. Mm -hmm. And they, they had that internal conflict even within that city. Yeah. Actually, Jim Knight's 
I, I think you um, mentioned this uh, comment that your father made about Germans that he met. Uh, How much he liked yeah. them. Yeah, he, he enjoyed, he liked the Germans. He didn't what, feel any animosity what, toward them for all this. Yeah, I could see. You had mentioned a comment that he made about, um, and I, I'm sorry, I forget what it was now, but the, that the, they 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 claimed to not know anything about what had happened, or um, um, that is true. Yeah, I don't I don't remember that. I remember. Um, oh yeah, he in one of his letters he said that. Uh, they don't want to be at war in Garlagen, about the people in Garlagen. They don't want to be in, at war any more than, than we do. Yet they had done that massacre. They've been involved in that massacre. So again, I, I don't know what he was thinking, where his head was at when he wrote that letter. You reminded me, one of the interviews we had was a, 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 um, a veteran who was up in um, New Hampshire. So he sent a crew up to New Hampshire and he went in after the tragedy, after it had happened and he was talking to somebody in the town and he was telling them that uh, you're going to have to go see it. And, and the person in the town didn't even know what he was talking about. And then, of course, he did have to go see it. So I see it's just about seven o'clock. And, um, you know, I, I know this is a point when Caitlin wants to um, <laughs> stop the recording and uh, maybe, you know, go on with her life. So uh, um, well, a number well, of us, I'm sure, would be happy to, to stay and talk if, uh, if people want to do that. But uh, Yeah, John, be, before we go, we ought to put in a plug for our next week's program that Hannah and Phoebe are, are leading. It's the last in our series, and um, uh, it's the... Uh, program that deals with how it's done or how right. it was done, how you uh, arrange the material and um, so how the we, exhibit was done. Okay. <laughs> Not the massacre. No, no, no. The, <laughs> how the show was done. Exactly. How the show was done. So, um, so yeah, that's going to be a, a great way to end it. And that's next Friday at 6 p.m. And you can register for that in the same way you have for all the other programs in the series. And thanks everyone for coming. It's it's been a, a real pleasure. Oh, thank you. Thanks have for, a good night. Thanks everybody. for sharing it.